Welcome to another scriptural study. In fact, a scriptural, astronomical, historical, and topical study in which we will get the opportunity to explore what we call the amazing Passover eclipse of 2020-22. As well, we all know that the 14th day of Abib is a preparation day the day before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in this case, starts in the evening on the 14th, going in past the dawn into the 15th day. So we're going to explore, once again, what the sun, moon, and stars do to reveal this scriptural sign that happens every year and announces the three days and three nights. As always, stop the video at any time to further focus on the scriptural, astronomical, historical, and backup evidence to this topic that is being shared. And ensure that you have your computer screens on full view mode or full screen configuration. Once again, it is better to view these scriptural study videos on a large computer screen due to the massive amounts of information. If you can't, we provide all of these visuals in the description box with a link. So, four topics in this particular scriptural study, starting off with what causes a partial solar eclipse astronomically let alone a full solar eclipse. Two, is this celestial event annually prophetic, let alone the upcoming Passover solar eclipse? Number three, was this celestial event, the three days and nights with the solar eclipse, historical? Do we have documentation in history that proves this indeed did happen? And finally, who rejects the Passover eclipse as scriptural truth and why? As always, these scriptural studies are embedded in the foundation of the three witnesses of light that exist during the four night watches, let alone what happens with the sun starting all the way from dawn into sunrise, high noon, sunset, and then into Arab, the evening moving into the four watches. Yes, all three witnesses of light in all four night watches that help us to learn what Yahuwah, our Father of Lights, is teaching us. No one teaches us this on earth. Only the Father of Lights can in regards to numbering our days and bringing our hearts to wisdom. Along with the scriptural set of stars that are seen on a solar eclipse on the 14th day, only in a month of a babe. So again, is this the amazing Passover eclipse of 2022? You betcha. Let's go explore this because this is going to happen once again on the pagan day of April 30th, 2022. And we knew this on our forecast over nine years ago. The definition of the word amazing is as follows, causing astonishment, great wonder. And this is why Bereans all over earth choose and have a desire to understand that the witnesses are indeed wonders, great wonders, causing great astonishment, and thus why our being observes them. So on to the study, because what causes a partial solar eclipse astronomically. Well, of course, it's the Father of Lights. It's nothing else. As we can read in Jacob or James chapter 1 verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of Lights. And we know this because in the beginning or bare sheath, Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, it's the almighty father of lights who said, let lights come to be in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and appointed times and for days and years. 
Yes, this sign on the 14th day of the first month of Abib annually exists, regardless if it's accompanied by a partial solar eclipse and or not. And again, this year it is going to happen on the pagan day of April 30th, 2022, because we knew this well over and above nine years ago. Furthermore, doesn't it state in scripture from Yaal or Joel chapter 2 verse 31 that the sun is turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah, which is another sign for those that study the sun, moon, and stars in its full completeness? Or in the book of Job, Eob chapter 9 verse 7, it's the father of lights who commands the sun and it does not rise and he seals up the stars. Wasn't the prophet Yeshayahu inspired to write in chapter 14, verse 10, For the stars of the heavens and their constellations, or Mazaroth, do not give off their light. The sun shall be dark at its rising, and the moon not send out its light. Furthermore, the emissary Shaul, now known today as the Apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 2, verse 20, stated, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and splendid day of Yahuwah. Again, a future uh, time, which uh, is something that we are all indeed looking very much forward to. So, this event happens annually in regards to the sun, moon, and stars sign. But it is not always accompanied with a partial solar eclipse. So we're going to get into this today. Why? And share and explore some of this information because any encyclical uh, research will reveal that a partial eclipse solar eclipse, is when the sun and moon are not exactly in line with the earth and the moon only partially obscures the sun. This phenomena can usually be seen from a large part of the earth outside of the track of an annular or total eclipse. Now as we go through this, I want you to think about the 14th day and a 15th day. Wikipedia further states total eclipses are rare because the timing of the new moon within the eclipse season needs to be more exact for an alignment between the observer on Earth and the centers of the sun and moon. Now, they understand that differently than a Berean would. We'll get into that. In addition, the elliptical orbit of the moon often takes it far enough away from Earth that its apparent size is not large enough to block the sun entirely. Total solar eclipses are rare at any particular location because totality exists only along a narrow path on the Earth's surface traced by the moon's full shadow or umbra. And as anyone knows, you can test and prove this for yourself outside in creation and or at home with a simple experiment. And as well, if you are indeed a Berean searching things in full and its completeness, you'll be fully aware that on the 30th day of the 12th month, we all knew on this particular 12th month that just passed, it would indeed have a 30th day. And we knew this over nine years ago. Why? Well, we track and forecast all of the witnesses of light with each of the three entities, including the sun, moon, and stars. But as it relates to the moon, we track each and every moon rise, each and every moon set. And when it hits the 180 degree mark, being what some believe to be the highest in the Shamaim or the closest, closest in regards to distance, we also track when it starts becoming 100% illuminated, its midpoint and its end point. So on the 30th day of the 12th month, over nine years ago, we knew the moon in all locations everywhere on earth that the moon would, be, would become fully restored, renewed, Kodesh. That's what that means, renewed. Again, a sliver moon or a dark conjunction moon on the 15th day is not renewed. Again, renewed is very simple to understand from even an English dictionary. So as an example, if you're on the Eastern time zone, for me, in my area, the moon became full at 10.22 a.m. on the 30th day, which happened to be the 16th day or Saturday, well after the dawn and sunrise. The midpoint was 2.22 p.m. 
And then 7.39 p.m. it became uh, fully finishing its restoration, announcing that tomorrow at the dawn, it would be New Moon Day. Again, all in the 30th day of the 12th month. If you go to Jerusalem, Israel, still on the 30th day of the 12th month, scripturally, again, we ignore the international date line. We ignore the Greenwich timeline line. We're on the 30th day of the 12th month of the celestial clock and calendar of Yahuwah, not man's time. Man's time just happened to be Saturday, April 16th and Sunday, April 17th. It had two dates, but we don't follow those dates. We follow, it was the 30th day of the 12th month. We knew well in advance there would be a 30th day for this particular 12th month. So as you can see, Jerusalem, it went at 522 p.m. Uh, full. It's midpoint 955 p.m. and all the way to 239 a.m. Uh, it stopped being 100% full again, announcing that the following dawn would be the new moon day, the first day of the first month of Abib. You have to nail the first day of the first month of Abib in order to understand when the 14th day is going to be. If you can't nail each and every new moon day correctly, you will then ignore all of the other signs. It's that simple. Take a look at Perth, Australia. The moon did not become full completely till 1022 p.m. Its midpoint was 2.55 a.m. and after the dawn finished being 100% illuminated. Again, all of this on the 30th day of the 12th month, regardless of where you reside on earth. And furthermore, it is new moon day in the heavens. Yes, in the Shamayim. So again, it was new moon day everywhere commencing at the dawn, which just so happened to be on the pagan day of Sunday, April 17th. But you have to understand this part. So stop the video now and really take a look at these numbers because you can forecast them as far back as you want to go and in the present, let alone ahead. It's that simple. And again, the light is a light on a lampstand. Our only teacher stated that they do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and it shines to all those in the house to see. All those in the house, everywhere on earth, including the Shamayim, knew that there would be a 30th day in the 12th month. Very basic, but it behooves many to this day, regrettably. And again, we're dealing with a restored moon, Kodesh, renewed. Not some shadow, not some darkness. So think about this for a moment. Because on a 15th day, Hanok stated that the moon would wholly disappear. And if that's sinking in, you're going to know why that a 14th day can produce a partial solar eclipse. Click. Hoo-ha. That's what happens. Astronomically, if you will. So again, I'm, I'm trying to be charismatic as possible. This was a big light bulb moment for us over uh, 10, 15 years ago. When this finally sunk in, this is when we knew we could forecast in advance and then go and test and prove it out in creation with a camera. And we have videos on this past first day, first month celestial sign for Beeb with film footage, photographs from all over Earth. And we knew this well over nine years in advance. It's that simple, along obviously with the stars. So this is what happens when you do see the signs of Yahuwah with all three witnesses of light and acknowledge them as witnesses being wonders and why our being observes them and why we rise before the dawn and Shua for help on this subject matter. We cry out and we do not discount our only teacher when he st stated that the moon this light would be a light on a lampstand for all to see in the house and why we watch all four night watches, especially the one at the 180 degree mark, all the way to the start of a true scriptural day, Bakar Shakar at dawn, where all three witnesses are telling us great signs and their wonders. They're amazing. And why when we go to bed, we meditate, on all of the night watches and what they share and tell us as it relates to numbering our days 
for signs, appointed times, days, and years. So again, my eyes go before the night watches to study the word. So this is why when someone asks or shares with us, uh, you have belief, and then we say, well, we have works as well. And then we say, show me your belief without your works. And then we say, I show you, I shall show you my belief by my works. So forecasting is a very healthy thing to do. The Magi knew how to do it. They went to the school of Daniel years later after Daniel had passed away. And there's much evidence to prove that. So again, if we are looking at the first day of the first month of Abib and you nail it, you will know why the upcoming solar eclipse could be well known in advance uh, as well. So as we knew, the moon... That light on a lampstand would be ruling with a set of stars like it does every year. So we already have taken film and photograph footage of the moon entering the house. It goes in alignment or in proximity to Spica and the foot of the preacher. And this star, Rigi al has many names, including to cry out. And then Arcturus, a triangulation as some do in regards to nailing the first day of the first month of Abib. And of course, the other scriptural stars, you will see um, Ursa Major in this position pointing us to the North Star. And you'll understand the position of the sun because as the historian said way back when, the sun in the month of Abib would be in alignment with the Lamb in the constellation known as Aries, or Tale in Hebrew, the morning star. And you would know where Palladius and Orion would be as well. So this is approximately the midnight, or between the second to third watch, you'd be looking for this. And I added the constellation art this year for some people that are still learning. You don't see constellation art in the Shamayim, obviously, or even Maseroth or constellation lines. So this is why we studied just the stars. And by the dawn, the moon would still be ruling in the house in that triangulation of scriptural stars that we can all read about, can't we? And as we can see, it's not sunrise yet. The lamb is heading towards the horizon. So this is a first day, first month of event. And everybody's seen the stars. They've seen Rigi the one who cried out, they seen Spica or Abib, and they seen Arcturus, the brightest star in the northern hemisphere. Everybody's seen that all over Earth, and we have photograph and film footage to prove it. Now, if you're in a northern hemisphere, you'll see Ursa Major. Some folks in the southern hemisphere will only see a portion of that. So again, here's the constellation art uh, along with that. So please take a look at the other videos with the film and photograph proof. So yes, stop the video now to glean this example a little further. You will be glad that you did because you can know well in advance for any given month, if it's going to be a 29th day month or a 30th day month. So in this case, uh, for the first day of the first month of Abib, we knew a decade in advance that the 12th month would have a 30th day, just based on this approach. Again, forecasting is extremely healthy, and why the Magi did it, and why they knew when to go to see the actual child, if you will, in regards to the first coming. It's that simple. It's not rocket science. And thus why even today, we can forecast decades in advance from the past or in advance or to the present like we see here for this latest and upcoming amazing solar eclipse that is scheduled on the 14th day of the first month of Abib. And it's going to be visible in the Southwest, South America, Pacific, Atlantic, and Antarctica. So for all of the Berean uh, friends that we get to study with, our study buddies, if you can get outside and take photograph and film footage of Orion and Pallades and the lamb on this day, that would be fabulous. And thank you for your forecasts. Even they're saying that the 14th day would be the same everywhere on earth. It's wonderful. So again, don't let someone tell you that you can have a new moon day on different days 
on the Gregorian. It's crazy. And this is why everyone will not have a solar eclipse on different days. It will be the 14th day of the first month of Abib for everywhere on earth and for everyone in the Shamayim on the pagan day of April 30th, 2022. The pagan day is irrelevant, obviously. It's truly the 14th day of the first month of Abib. So please focus because here's one example from Puerto Williams, Chile. And they even know how long it's going to be because many people say, well, wait a minute, it couldn't have been the moon eclipsing the sun, causing the sun to blot out during the, the death on the stake uh, from 12 noon to 3 p.m. this eclipse. It had to be something else. Meanwhile, the Father of Lights provides these sun, moon, and stars for signs and for certain days and appointed times. So it's two hours, 17 minutes, and 36 seconds. So this is a partial eclipse. A total eclipse, obviously, could be for three hours. It's astronomically and absolutely and empirically true. We have proof. And we have proof coming up on this next amazing solar eclipse, don't we? And again, two hours, 17 minutes, and 36 seconds. That's how well we can forecast, just like the Magi. In fact, we're behind what the Magi knew, and we'll get into that a little bit as we go forward. So looking for some great shots here, folks, from all of our Berean study buddies in the locations that we'll be able to see it. So again, take a look at this particular website. You could track every solar eclipse, let alone lunar eclipse, but for this example online, here are the solar eclipses from 2000 BCE to 1 BCE, 1 CE to 2000 CE. So this is not rocket science. We have the means to do this. And this is not man's information. Again, man is recording this data with the sun, moon, because it's reliable from the father of lights. It's that simple. So... What causes a partial solar eclipse astronomically? Hallelujah, the father of lights. Yahuwah himself, the only self-existent one. It's incredible how the world and those still associated and imprisoned in world religions will not accept what exists. It's incredible. So, looking forward to those pictures for the folks and the Brian study buddies that we are privileged to study scripture with, looking for photograph and film footage, and we'll get into what. Because we forecasted this well over a decade ago, and as you can see on our summary page from last year, the first month of Abib in 2021, all the way to the first month of 2022. We are taking our time this year in completing this, we have a little project going on that's going to provide a little bit more detail and why and how the Magi knew the certain star in relation to the sun and moon. They knew Kodesh. They knew the fully restored scriptures. And that information came from Daniel, in which if you look at the historical records, he did have a school that many attended years and years after Daniel's death. So let's get into this a little bit further, shall we? Because if you just go with the sun, moon, and stars and ignore the writings of Moshe, remember, the Torah matches all of this. It matches the first day of the first month. It matches what happened every day in the first month of Abib and why we're to guard it. We're to guard the writings of Moshe and the counts for the first month of Abib. And by the way, Hanok's counts match as well, let alone Daniel's counts match as well, along with Yahukanan, the revelator, as we can read in the book of Revelation. But people ignore what exists. They ignore the very first page of Scripture, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. And again, on this YouTube channel, we admit we did the very same thing. I'm hitting 62 years of age. I started to be exposed to this in my early 40s, and I denied it. I rejected it. 
And thankfully, due to the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and patience, all the way up to self-control, some Bereans shared and continued to share this with me along with the scriptural stars. And more importantly, over and above forecasting, got me and my better three quarters to go outside and film and photograph this. So again, what causes a partial solar eclipse astronomically, let alone a total solar eclipse? Of course, the father of light, Yahua, the only self-existent one. So is this celestial event prophetic? Does the word tell us this? Well, we know it is prophetic from an astronomical standpoint, but didn't our only teacher, the Messiah, Yahushua, the one who cried out to his father on that 14th day for his deliverance, Shua? Yes, he did state to the Pharisees back then, quote, but he answering said to them, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Yonah known today as Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, fish, so shall the son of Adam be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is the starting of the count of the three days and three nights because he was placed in the tomb on the 14th day just before sunset. So make a long story short, is there more? Well, yeah, Marcus and the rest of the apostles, the emissary stated that when the sixth hour, 12 noon, came darkness, came over all the land up until the ninth hour, 3 p.m., our time. So we have scriptural evidence of this. This is why he's the word, the lesser light, who shouts out to the greater light for his deliverance. The word knew this, and he backed up what is stated in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 17, etc., etc., so what happens astronomically all over Earth, all over Earth? So here is a shot from Jerusalem, and it's on Stellarium. And at 12 noon on the pagan day of April 30th, the moon will be in alignment with the sun. It's not going to cause a solar eclipse in this location. But they, if they did, they would see the star known as Hamal just below the sun. And they would see uh, Pallades, the seven sisters, and Orion. Everyone on earth would see this in Jerusalem if there was a solar eclipse. And they would see a portion of Ursa Major with the North Star. All of the scriptural stars. There are reasons why Yahuwah ensured that the evil scribes could not rub out these particular scriptural stars. They rubbed out many others, but they didn't have any success whatsoever to eliminate these now, did they? It's a scriptural, empirical, absolute truth that they are written. And they are in the heavens on the 14th day of the first month of Abib. Not before Abib, the 12th month, and not after in the second month. He died on the 14th day of the first month of Abib, and this is the sign for it. But many will reject it. They will reject the sign of Jonah and, in fact, reject the chief cornerstone, the Messiah, Yahushua. They will reject him. We all have been there. This is a humbling exercise. It's about humility. It's about bringing us to a level of understanding that the Almighty Yahuwah, the Father of Lights, is the only self-existent one. And that the Righteous Ones, His firstborn of creation, gave us that great example to shout out and to cry out Shua for our deliverance. As the psalmist knew, all Righteous Ones shall cry out for their deliverance. So this is Jerusalem. And if we went to my hometown, uh, Eastern Time Zone, New York and all those same places, check it out, the moon will be, the lesser light will be pointing us to the greater light. There's Hamal just below it, and Pallades, the Seven Sisters, and Ursa um, Orion, and then Ursa Major in its position. For a 14th day of the first month of Abib. Same, same as Jerusalem. If we went to Perth, Australia, at the same time period, again, this moon will be going into partial Oh, sorry, the sun will be going into a partial eclipse and Stellarium even shows that little dot there like that. 
So at the end of the day, they're going to see the lamb as well. They're going to see the seven sisters of Ryan. They won't have a view on Ursa Major, though. Everywhere on earth on the 14th day of the first month of Abib, which will be the pagan day of April 30th. Yes, Saturday. Everywhere on earth. You cannot have this event on two separate days. And that's why you can't have a new moon day on two different days. It's that simple. Again, an empirical, absolute, astronomical truth. Undeniable. But some people will reject it. We've all been through this. But we have a confident expectation. Love, joy, peace, and patience. The fruit of the Spirit will humble us all to this simple truth. So again, for all of these folks in the southern Hemis plain, if you can get a shot during the eclipse of Hamal, the Seven Sisters in Orion, please do so, just like we did for the first month of Abib, proving why at the dawn, on Sunday, April 17th, it was New Moon Day everywhere on Earth. So let's get some shots of this uh, film and or photograph footage, which would be just fabulous. So again, is this celestial event prophetic? <laughs> you betcha. Our Messiah, Yahushua, who cried out to his father, our only teacher, giving this, those great examples, definitely said it was prophetic. And it's prophetic here and now. It's prophetic every year on the 14th day of the first month of Abib. This does not happen on the 12th month ever, and it doesn't happen in the second month. It is what it is. But how many people actually like reality? They like to make things up. Welcome to world religions and the imaginations of the traditions of men. Was this celestial event recognized historically in the past? Well, we certainly have scriptural evidence that states that, but is the historical record outside of scripture backing this up? Well, yes, Josephus said that the sun would be in Aries on the 14th day of the lunar month when the sun is in Aries. So we've just shared that the sun is with the constellation or Maseroth Aries. And the middle star of those three stars is known as the Lamb, Tele. So historically, scripturally, and astronomically, all the evidence points to the first day of the first month. You nail that. And then on the 14th day, of the first month of Abib, this is in existence. Not on the 12th month and not on the second month. There will be people attempting to tell you that the 12th month this happened. It didn't. Take a look at the conjunction and all the sliver moon people that celebrated a month in advance. And there will be some people telling you the death happened in the second month. It's silly, but again, we have historical evidence. So Dionysius stated the very same thing. These are historical records. Even the historian Eusebius mentioned this as well. Stop the video because there are more historical evidence, but these three witnesses should be suffice. And again, we are fully at peace with the people that reject all of this evidence and why. Again, presumptuous ones want to rule over you. The beast wants to rule over you and have you reject all of this empirical and absolute truth. So of course this celestial event was recognized historically. And finally, who rejects, who actually will reject the Passover eclipse as scriptural truth and why? Remember, again, I'm hitting 62 years of age here soon. It's embarrassing still to admit that I rejected all of this because of the traditions of men and how strong that beast was over me and my family. So let's take a look at who does this because 7,000 times the name of Yahuwah is replaced in the scriptures with Lord and God, which obviously are not even the proper titles for Yahuwah, the Almighty One, the only self-existent one. So these are the folks that reject this. The other folks that reject the information we're sharing is they're rejecting what exists. They're rejecting the self-existent one because they're more comfortable with the traditions of men 
and the imaginations of men that even create wrong titles such as Lord and God, Adonai, if you will. Uh, we use these terms for all superhuman beings of the heathen mythologies, which has nothing to do with Yahuwah, the self-existent one. So, as we get into this, they're also attempting to replace the word. Yahushua is the word, and no other name is the word. No other name, not Isus, not Jesus Christos, not Yahusha. Yahushua is what they're trying to replace. They're trying to replace the word with Shah worship, Lord God worship. Shah means to bring the name to nothingness, to make it obsolete. So this is a pretty strong comment to make. Can you back it up with scripture? Well, we can because the prophet Aliyahu, this name means the Almighty One is Yahuwah. So this prophet came to all the people. In fact, it was a bunch of priests back at that time, that time that were Lord God worshipers. They were bringing the name to Shah or not. How long would you keep hopping between two opinions, Aliyahu stated to them? If Yahuwah is the Almighty Almighty One, the Father of Lights, follow him. But if Baal, the Lord, Lord God, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Well, all of these world religions answer without a word on this. We know this. We've just shared this in the previous scriptural study video entitled, What's in a Name? And we thank people for giving us these resources to know what to come out of. Yes, not just Christianity, but Islam and atheism mindsets. They're all Babylonian mindsets. The same as Hindus, Buddhists, folk religionists, other religions such as Hebrew roots and Messianic movements. Remember, Hebrew and Messianic movements are worshipping what NASA is proclaiming as a new moon, which is a dark conjunction moon. A dark conjunction moon, as Hanok said, wholly disappears. It loses all of its light. That's not a restored new moon. That's not Kodesh. Even a crescent moon is not. So even the Judaic people uh, are rejecting this, all because of influence from Babylon. And the prophet Ezekiel said in chapter 29, verse 19, Therefore thus said the master Yahuwah, I am giving the land of Egypt, Mitzrayim, to Nebuchadnezzar, sovereign of Babel. And we do know that Kepha said that Rome was the second Babylon. Again, this principality is where we take the fight. We don't strive with flesh and blood. The good fight is against the principalities because... The devil, or Satan, Lucifer, is the one that's been given the authority to deceive the whole world. And we can read in Lucas chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, And the devil, taking him up on high a mountain, Yahushua, showed him all the reins of the world in a moment of time. So in a very short period of time of that dialogue, showed him all of human history. And the devil said to Yahushua, all of this authority I shall give you and their esteem for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. He gives it to the world religions. But Yahushua, the one that cried out to his father, would have nothing to do with it. He knew rank and file. He knew that he was the lesser light. He knew that his father was greater. But the devil, no way, he wants the throne. And thus why Yahushua sits at the right hand of the Father. We know that we are of the Almighty One, Yahuwah, and all the world lies in the wicked one. And we know that the Son of the Almighty Yahuwah has come and has given us an understanding so that we might know the true one, the true Messiah, the anointed one of Yahuwah. And we are in the true one, in his son Yahushua Messiah, the one who cried out to his Father. He does not usurp his father. He does not sit on the throne. He sits at the right hand of the father while the wicked one wants to sit on the throne. Remember, the Pope calls himself father. We are not to do that. No one is to do that. So this principality is where we take the fight and why we don't strive with the flesh, with people. There's no need. The evidence takes care of it. The evidence reveals the truth. What people do with it is between them and the Father of Lights. So the, what is the truth? Well, 
when the land of Egypt was given to Babel, what happened? The non-scriptural belief system that one God can be many gods, the Trinity, if you will, uh, came from Egypt and then was passed on to Babylon. And we know this. It's archaeological and historical truth. Many people will reject this. The world religions do not want you to really dive into this because the great dragon was thrown out of the heavens, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who leads all the world astray. He was thrown to the earth and his messengers were thrown out with him. So he brings the name to naught. He creates the three gods in one, or even two gods in one. Remember, Satan doesn't care as long as you don't worship the almighty Yahuwah, the only self-existent one. He wants you to ignore the self-existent one. And he wants you to ignore that the word, the Messiah Yahushua, was brought forth, the firstborn of all creation. He wants you to forget that. That's Satan's plan. That is the tools that he uses to lead the whole world astray in world religions. Out of 7.9 billion people on earth today, as at the end of the pagan month of March, at the end of 2021, this was the estimated amount of people in those world religions. Count it up. So again, these are the tools that he uses, the name, false religious systems, and again, religion, all world religions are non-scriptural. And this is why they shout out, praise the Lord God, Jesus is my Lord, Allah is my Lord, Allah Akbar, God is great. Again, Shah Jahan, it's a Persian term, which means Lord of Lords, Lord of the world or the universe. It's why the Pope is the father of the universe. Understand what it means in regards to the writings, the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. It means the universe, and that's the father of the universe, no different than Shah Jahan the Father or Lord of the world or the universe. It's all the same poop. Even the Judaism, Lord and Master, Shah on Shah, even in Asian world religions. These are the tools in which that great dragon was thrown out. He leads the whole world astray. So these things are easy to share because even the archaeology, take a look. Crescent moon with solar. Crescent moon with solar disks. So this is from Egypt that ended up in Babylon. See, I'm giving the land of Mitzrayim to Nebuchadnezzar, sovereign of Babel, all the way down to the Roman Catholic Church, both Catholics and Protestants, and all of the other denominations, including Islam and Judaism. It's all the same poop. They shah on Yahuwah. Please don't shah on the name which is above all names. You have enough evidence, and isn't this a wonderful opportunity now that we have been humbled to understand this, been privileged to, given, to be given this information, to share with others to not love the world, nor that which is in the world, because if anyone loves the world, it's an example showing that the love of the Father is not in them. So at the end of the day, we've all been through this. This is our journey coming out of this world, coming out of her. So let's get into some historical information from the encyclical record about what is going on here with all of this. In Wikipedia, um, it states something about the replacement of Passover and the sign of Jonah, the three days and nights. It goes on to say, and again, we don't believe in the Christian term replacement theology. We place this visual on this slide because it references what is being replaced. We're attempting to share how this beast wants to replace Passover, unleavened bread, and the Feast of First Fruits, the sign of Jonah, the three days and three nights. What is the prize here for this beast? Why are they trying to deceive everybody? 
Well, let's read it. As a movable feast, the date of Easter is determined in each year through a calculation known as computus, Latin for computation. Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday after the full moon. Now think about that, which is the first full moon on or after the first Sunday after the full moon, which is fixed on the 21st of March or approximation of the March equinox. Remember, Babylon, Nimrod, use the equinox. We don't. We use the sun, moon, and stars. But many, even in the Hebrew and Messianic movement, is still under the beast, the system. Determining this date in advance requires a correlation between the lunar months and the solar year, while also accounting for the month, date, and weekly of the Julian or Gregorian calendar. So, the date of the Jewish feast of Passover, which Christians believe is when the Lord Jesus, the Shah, was crucified. So, Let's get into this further. It was originally feasible for the entire Christian church to receive the date of Easter each year through an annual announcement by the Pope, by the Father of the Universe. By the early 3rd century, however, communications in the Roman Empire had deteriorated to the point that the church put great value in the system that would allow the clergy, the church elite, to determine the date for themselves, independently and consistently. Additionally, the church wished to eliminate dependencies on the Hebrew calendar to replace so they didn't know the Passover. They could do Easter instead. Easter is non-scriptural. Esther, understand that's a pagan deity that is Trinitarian based. Dependency on the Hebrew calendar, they wanted to replace it by deriving the date for Easter directly from the March equinox, just like Nimrod did. So again, I'm giving the land of Mitzrayim to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Understand who Nebuchadnezzar is. You'll be shocked. In the reckoning of time, 725, Bede, an individual, used computus as a general term for any sort of calculation. Although he refers to the Easter cycles of Theophilus as a paschal computus, by the end of the 8th century, computus came to refer specifically to the calculation of time. The calculations produce different results depending on whether the Julian calendar, because the Eastern Orthodox, the Eastern leg of Daniel's statue, or the Gregorian calendar is used, the Western leg of Daniel's statue. For this reason, the Catholic Church and Protestant churches, which follow the Gregorian calendar, celebrate Easter on a different date from that of the Eastern Orthodox churches, which are still set to the Julian. That's why last week you still had East Eastern world religions, still under Lord Baal Shah worship. It was the drift of 21 March from the observed equinox that led to the Gregorian reform of the calendar to bring them back into line, all with the intent to replace Passover, replace true numbering of days. So this is the historical record. And the archaeological record proves this as well all through time. Again, this is going to be rejected. We know that we do not have the power to restore this. This is the job of the Messiah, Yahushua. When he returns, he will restore all things. He's going to fulfill the complete and full prophetic timeline on behalf of his Father of Lights, Yahuwah, the only self-existent one. All of this will be replaced. It will be eliminated. Hallelujah. So as we go through the study, you start to understand why the prophet was inspired to write Yashiau in chapter 1, verse 14. My being hates your new moons and your appointed times. They are trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. Again, take a look at Roman Catholicism. It replaced Passover. It has a different computus. It ignores the scriptural calendar. So does Islam. The Egyptians and the Babylonians eliminated all of this. And the Jews in their two exiles, regrettably, adopted what the Babylonians taught them. So this will be replaced because from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, eventually all shall come to worship Yahuwah. So we don't have the power to reinstall this, to restore it all. This will be the job of the Messiah, Yahushua. Some of us are just getting a head start with love, joy, and peace and patience. And we're working on our self-control to deliver this in the utmost of kindness to all that ask. We are giving them a confident expectation 
when a question is asked by doing these in-depth studies, full and complete, not one little picture with a scriptural passage, but complete studies week after week after week. Here's something else that's rejected. So how many people reject even numbering their days on a piece of paper according to the inspired writings of Moshe? How many do that? They put the ignore mode on. So they don't number their days. And as a result, they're not aware of the solar eclipse. They're not even looking for one. They're not even looking to understand the stars and their alignment on the 14th day with the sun and where the moon is. It's off the radar, so to speak. Ignore mode is fully on. And in most cases, it's not other people's fault. The beast is so effective that it blinds them. When you show on the name or you show on this information, you're making it obsolete. That's the goal of Shaw worshippers. They're making it obsolete. I know this is tough to hear. It was tough for us to hear as well. So let's look a little closer, shall we, at the three days and three nights. Let's take a closer look at it. Because the 14th day of any scriptural month is a preparation day. Yes, the lamb, the word, was prepared on the 14th day. He was murdered on the stake. And the start of a any scriptural day is shikar in the morning at the dawn and the start of the three days and three nights count is when he died right when he cried out to his father and there was the solar eclipse from 12 uh, noon to 3 p.m our time the third to the sixth hour in the time back then in the scriptures when this event happened so this is day one he was put in the tomb on day one he wasn't there for the full daylight hours, but he was there on that day. It's the start of the count. And then he was in there in the evening and everybody celebrated Passover in the evening like we do now. Passover is celebrated in the evening, starts in the evening. And that day ends at that nighttime period. It ends at the dawn. And then it goes into the 15th day, Shagar, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then in the evening... Feast of Unleavened Bread is finalized. Here's the second night. Finishes at the dawn. Here's the Feast of First Fruits. He's in the tomb all day here. He goes and stays in the tomb all through the night. And he comes out at the end of the Sabbath. First Fruits is a Sabbath based on Moshe's writings. Based on Moshe's writings, it's a Sabbath. And it ends towards the dawn. And that's why the apostles stated in this example with Matith Yahu, gift of Yahuwah, chapter 28, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, first first Sabbath, towards the dawn on the first day of the week. This is the first day of any uh, scriptural month. It's in fact the third week. It's, this is the first day of the week. So it's the end of the first day of the week, towards the dawn. It's still the first day of the week, day and night. And they came to the tomb right there. They waited till the first fruit Sabbath was completed. So this is being rejected. And we're at peace with why? Because this is the only sign. And the Pharisees, you know, the Catholics back then, the Protestants back then, the Muslims back then, the Hindus back then. On and on it goes, right? So at the end of the day, nothing changes. This sign is still being rejected to this very day. So as we go through this a little further, the other thing that's being rejected is, again, Shikar. A day starts at the dawn. This is part of Jonah's writings. Jonah told us about the three days and three nights. He told us when a day starts. All of this is being rejected by these world religions. Because they, like the Yehudim and the Greeks, seek wisdom. But Bereans proclaim Messiah impaled. But to the Yehudim, it's a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, it's foolishness. So as we can see here, three days and three nights in these world religions is deemed as foolishness. 
Now, in most cases, like we said, it's un unintentional. They never heard about this. But we have the opportunity to share this in kindness. Do the work. Do a full and complete study. Not, you know, a little bit of verbiage on Twitter or Instagram or one little visual on Facebook. Do the work. Do the full and complete work, the Kodesh work, the fully restored work. And we'll be very glad that you did, all of us. Now, some will say that uh, this is not true because uh, how could, you know, he be killed on the 14th? Well, at the end of the day, the memorial meal was on the 13th, going into the 13th evening. And he was then brought through the night from the Mount of Olives, tortured, you know, obviously questioned by Pilate and uh, Herod and so forth. And this all happened and he was placed on the stake and he died. Now, they don't believe this. Well, contact this individual. He is excellent. Uh, let them know that uh, Michael sent you. His name is Danny. He's a great tour guide. And you can do this walk in the total time as written by Scripture. And you can do this total walk. You have a time to do it. From here to here is a very, very short um, walking distance from the Mount of Olives all the way into the locations of Herod and Pilate and so forth, where he was tortured, regrettably. But it's rejected. So again, don't trust me. We just provide evidence so you can follow up for yourself. So reach out to Danny. He's very good at what he does. I've talked to him uh, twice now. And he can set, set up self-guided walking tours uh, and or give you a guide and you can go to the, all the locations from a scriptural standpoint. Furthermore, people are trying to wipe out that the Messiah Yahushua was actually murdered on the stake due to a non-scriptural belief that there was no offerings. Animals weren't killed. So again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 22 through 23 are alive and well in this day and age, uh, just as it was uh, alive and well, regrettably, in the day of Shaul. And even the choice, the decision why Jerusalem was uh, chosen because in archaeology, this location was, in regards to elevation, the perfect spot. So the stones do indeed cry out because if you do get into why this uh, location was chosen, you can get uh, further information in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 14, with even King Hezekiah, and how the blood from the sacrifices or offerings uh, rolled down all the way to the Sea of Arabath, if you will. So uh, Kindron Valley to this day uh, gets rid of much sewage. It's actually a human rights issue where they're not taking care of the environment in that location with the sewage. And they're using the same drainage system that the temple used. And you can prove this for yourself during that tour. Ask Danny to go to Robinson's Arch where the blood channel uh, opened into Herod's drainage ditch. You can see all of this by other historians and archaeolog archaeologists such as Charles Warren, 1867-70. There's much more to this. So, three days and three nights will be rejected. It was rejected back then. It was the only sign given to the elite priesthood. And there are some self-proclaimed elite priests today. They're self-proclaimed, but they're really not. I'm not a priest. I'm, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a prophet. At the end of the day, I'm a Berean, striving to become noble, to be further humbled so that I can be fully restored, put off the old man and put on the new man. So I'm still a work in progress, so to speak. I'm a wretched man. I admit that I have need still. And thus why we fully recognize the solar eclipse as a sign that is written scripturally, that is astronomically proven that is backed up by historical documentation. Again, only in the month of Abib does this happen in regards to this particular sign scripturally. It doesn't happen in the second month, it doesn't happen in the 12th month, or even a 13th month. So, um, pretty basic, but it will be rejected. Don't get upset. I made the mistake personally, regrettably, 
many years ago when this information was given to me to be far too harsh. I now am learning the fruit of the Spirit from the Messiah Yahushua, my only teacher. Even to death he didn't lose it. He asked the Father to forgive those that were killing him. What great examples. But there's a parable to all of this, isn't there? And our only teacher gave us a parable why this would be rejected. Quote, right from the Messiah Yahushua, the one who cried out to his father. Here another parable. There was a certain man, a householder, who planted a vineyard and placed a hedge around it and dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. And he leased it to farmers and went abroad. And when the season of the first fruits drew near, remember, he's the first fruits. He rose on the third day, 16th day, at the end of that nighttime period towards the dawn, he rose. And when the season of the first fruits drew near, he sent his servants to the farmers to receive its fruit. And the farmers took his servants and beat one, and they killed one, and they stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Our Messiah, Yahushua, goes on to say with this parable, And at least he sent his son to them, saying, They sh shall respect my son. But when the farmers saw the son, they said amongst themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us possess his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the master of the vineyard comes, Yahuwah, what shall he do to those farmers? What will even the Messiah Yahushua do when he returns the second time? They said to him, evil ones, they said to him, Father, the only self-existent one, Yahuwah, and the Messiah Yahushua, the Son, evil ones, he shall bring them to evil destruction and lease the vineyard to other farmers who shall give to him the fruits in their seasons in the millennium. Yehushua said to them, Did you ever read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? The word is the chief cornerstone, the lesser light who calls out to the greater light. This was from Yahuwah, and it is marvelous in our eyes. But to the Yahuadim and to the Greeks, the Gentiles, it's foolishness. The three days and three nights is foolishness. Now this is a parable that you can hang your hat on. It's clearly explained so that each and every one of us all through time can understand. But we are not delusional. It will be rejected. And that's why it has been written and given to us. It goes on to further say in this parable, because of this I say to you, this is the Messiah Yahushua, the reign of the Almighty Father of Lights after the millennium, shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits of it. And he who falls on this stone shall be broken, but on whomever it falls, he shall be pulverized. And the chief priests and Pharisees, the elite self-proclaimed leaders at that time, having heard his parables, knew that he was speaking of them. And seeking to lay hands on him, they feared the crowds, they were more worried about the esteem of the people. Yehukun in chapter 5. They're more worried about the esteem of people than the esteem from the Father of Lights, which they weren't seeking. So seeing they held him to be a prophet. And this is why he was killed. This parable is so clear, so concise. And this is why we rejoice in the writings of Matith Yahu, Gift of Yahuwah, chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. And as they were eating the memorial meal on that 13th evening, Yahushua took bread and having blessed, broke and gave it to the taught ones and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood, that, uh, that of the renewed covenant which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he said, eat of his body. This is very confusing to the Yehudim to this very day. It's very confusing to the Gentiles. It's foolishness 
to these folks to this very day. So again, it's not Jesus is my Lord, praise the Lord God the Father, Allah is my Lord, Allah Akbar, God is great, Lord of Lords, or the world or the universe, Shah, Shah on Shah. It's not Adonai. We don't go worship in Bunshahs and Taishas and Shinshahs. We are not going to be deceived anymore or led astray by the great dragon who was thrown to the earth with his messengers that have now have the authority at this small moment of time in the age of man to rule. We are attempting to come out in every way possible without any more uh, of having any desire to love the world or that which is in it. We are tired of the archaeology. We were deceived by this, that the Father is the Son and the Son is the Father. Sure, Yahuwah is one with his son. The son is obedient. That's why they're one. It's like in a marriage between a man and a wife. They become one with children and they become one if they study the scriptures together. They become one in getting rid of this. They will never be the father. I will never be the father. I can act in his way and become one with him just as his son did. I have that opportunity, and this is why we do these full and complete Kodesh scriptural studies and get rid of everything that you're seeing here and why we focus on the three days and three nights just like Moshe did. We do not reject. Now, there are going to be some people out there that'll say, oh no, he died on the second month at the second Passover. Well, let's take a look at that a little bit further. And we read in Bembadar, chapter 9, verses 4 through 7, the book of Numbers, and Moshe spoke to the children of Yashrael to perform the Passover. Now let's take a look at these verses because they ignore what I'm about to read. So they performed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month, between the evenings in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that Yahuwah commanded. So the first Passover on the 14th day of the first month is the main Passover. It's the one that you've got to nail. But... There are two things that can happen that can defile you. And if you're around a dead body, you cannot go to the first Passover. You're defiled. You're around a dead body. And some of you may be on a long journey where something happens and you can't make the first Passover. You cannot perform the Passover on the 14th day of the first month of a beep. So this does happen. You could have a death in the family or you can be on a journey. So these individuals that experienced this came before Moshe and Aaron. Aaron was consecrated on New Moon Day. And those men said to him, we are defiled for the being of a man. They are around a dead body. Why are we withheld from bringing near the offering of Yuh at its appointed time among the children of Yashrael? So, again, you can't perform the Passover if you're around a dead body. And even any encyclical research without any effort will tell you this. The second Passover occurs every year on the 14th day. Certain men were ritually impure from contact with human corpses and therefore ineligible to participate on the 14th day of the first month of Abib. Faced with conflict of the requirement to participate, they went to Moshe and Aaron. So we know this because, furthermore, Scripture interprets Scripture, not people. The Scriptures interpret Scripture. And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe in verse 9, verse through 11, saying, speak to the children of Yisrael, saying, when any male of you or your generation is unclean for a being, dead body, or is far away on a journey, he shall still perform the Passover of Yahuwah on the 14th day of the second month. Between the evenings they perform it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they eat it. So, what compassion. Yahuwah knows there are some circumstances and out of compassion, gives everyone another opportunity, even though if you're around a dead body in the first month. And the apostles, yes, had the memorial meal on the 13th day going into the 13th evening of the first month of Abib. Why do we know this? Because the apostles knew they were going to be around the dead body 
of the Messiah, Yahushua. Now the Passover and the festival and bread was after two days. So they knew this sometime on the 11th or 12th day of the first month of Abib because the chief priests and scribes were seeking on how to take him through treachery and put him to death. So they knew they'd have to stay and go to the second Passover. They knew this. But what happens? Well, because people want to rub out people still imprisoned in world religions, whether it's conscious or unconscious, they want to rub out the three days and three nights, the sign of Jonah, the historical records that showed that from an astronomical standpoint, let alone what the sun, moon, and stars do today. All of that evidence is being attempted to be rubbed out, including Moshe's writings, as we can see here. Take the time to stop the video and number your days just with the scriptures, as this example does. And here's what they do. They focus on only one verse out of chapter 19 in an attempt to confuse everybody. And here's what they state. They quote, but the man who is clean and is not on a journey. But the man who is clean, not around a dead body, and who is not late for the first Passover on the 14th day of the first month of Abib, and has failed to form the Passover, that same being shall be cut off from among his people, because he did not bring an offering of Yehu at its appointed time. That man bears sin. So they hang their hat on this one verse without the rest of the verses that we just read. And they say that the Messiah is clean. He wasn't on a journey. So as a result, it's impossible that he died on the 14th day of the first month of Abib because how can he be the offering if he didn't eat the Passover meal in the evening? Well, hello, the Messiah Yahushua is the offering. He is the lamb. And we all and they consumed him in the evening, drink his blood, eat his body. That was the example. Can you believe there are self-proclaimed priests today saying that the Messiah Yahushua was disobedient to his father? Can you believe this? When in fact, he sweat blood before this event. And he gave himself up willingly. What an embarrassment that this is happening. This is horrifying that people are actually saying the Messiah Yahushua did not die on the 14th because he would have been disobedient to his father. Unbelievable. He was so obedient to his father that he willingly gave himself up. But they can't get their heads around it, right? It's foolishness to the Yehudim and to the Gentiles. Furthermore, what did the Messiah Yahushua state when the priests self-proclaimed or the elite uh, accused him way back when about anything to do with the Sabbath? When he was uh, plucking uh, pieces of the corn in the field with his taught ones. Here's what the Messiah Yeshua said to them back then, which is very, very healthy to quote today. Or did you not read in the Torah that on the Sabbath the priests in the set apart place profane the Sabbath and are blameless? They consume parts of the offering, as we know. Goes on to say, but I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the set apart place. And if you had known what this means, Messiah Yahushua talking, I desire compassion and not offering. You would not have condemned the blameless. Yes, he was clean. He was blameless on the 14th and he willingly gave himself up. Now you know what you're guarding in the month of Abib and why that one month you guard. Why? Why? Uh, Moshe was inspired to write to guard the month of Abib. There is a war here, and it's a spiritual war because people don't know what this means. And the ones that do don't understand the willing offering of compassion. You would have not condemned the blameless. How many people attempt to condemn the Messiah Yahushua? They are suicidal. For the son of Adam is master of the Sabbath. He gave himself up on the 14th day just like the inspired writing state from Moshe, just like the historical records confirm the astronomical signs, all of it, all of it matches. So again, out of love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, all the way to self-control. We have the opportunity to love the Yehudim and even the Gentiles that still consider this foolishness. We have the opportunity to love them. So let's do full, complete, Kodesh, fully restored studies with all of the information. Let's not add or take away. So, we further uh, accomplished this with three latest studies that we have just done on the sign of Jonah, Abib in the sign of Jonah, and who rejects the sign of Jonah, and why. We go into greater detail than this scriptural study. And if you're interested in learning why we have to guard Abib with the sun, moon, and stars, and why we must guard the month of Abib and Moshe's counts, seeing the full moon and its scriptural stars all over earth for everyone, no matter where you reside, please take the time to see these scriptural studies. Because these four questions in this particular scriptural study are easy to test and prove. Anyone can do them. And thus why we consider the upcoming solar eclipse to be amazing. Yes, hallelujah for the amazing Passover eclipse of 2022, uh, 14th day of the first month, which will indeed occur everywhere, everywhere for everyone on the pagan day of Saturday, April 30th, 2022. Again, the definition of amazing is causing astonishment and great wonder. And these scriptural witnesses for those that don't reject them are indeed astonishing. So, as the psalmist had stated, Yahuwah's witnesses, the father of life's witnesses are wonders. So why our being observes them just like the Messiah, Yahushua, observed them willingly as an offering. The only offer, offering and the finer, final offering for the redemption of humankind. So, with all of that said, we're looking forward to the photographs, even from our study buddies in Perth, South America, looking for pictures of the Lamb, Seven Sisters, and Orion during that solar eclipse of two hours, two and a half hours, if you will. If you can get photograph and film footage, uh, I was going to travel there to South America to a place called Ushua at the southern tip of South America, but I have a trip uh, planned in the couple weeks or months after that uh, our older boy Matthew is having his first child with his wife so we're gonna make the uh, trip to that location to see that of course and we're also looking for uh, uh, pictures that we received last year so just before the dawn uh, at the end of the 16th day so you got the day period and then the night period all the way to the dawn uh, Hamal from the dawn to sunrise will rise above the horizon that star and last year the Buku shot or the best shot came from BC Tara she got pictures of this of the star Hamal uh, at the dawn and we're looking for pictures of that because last year uh, first fruits was on the pagan day of May 13th and this year the same sign will occur for everyone on earth everyone will see Hamal between the dawn and sunrise come up. So again, we're looking for this shot again for first fruits. And uh, this will be on the pagan day of May 3rd. And from the dawn to sunrise, this view is the sunrise view. So we're looking for photograph and film footage of this again. And uh, again, the sun, moon and stars align us. World religions will ensure you reject this. And if you're interested in the first fruit sign and how to photograph it, let alone how it works year after year after year, these two scriptural study videos may be of value for you and your loved ones. Again, the Magi knew how to forecast. We can know this here and now today. We are behind. In the school of Daniel, they had more data. They had supposedly hundreds and hundreds of years of each sign for every day in the four night watches. Uh, we're only talking about, you know, during the solar eclipse here. We're talking about uh, as the 16th day is coming to an end towards the dawn, that nighttime period going into the 17th day. That's all we're talking about here. These guys had every day and night, and that's why they knew the star, which announced the birth and why it took them so long to get there. But they knew how to follow it. 
they understood this in a far greater sense of depth and detail than we do here today. Even with our advances with apps and the computer programs, these guys had far better information because they did it outside every night. Each day in a full solar year, 365.25 days, just like Hanok said, and they knew why the sun and stars brought in a year in 364, because if you multiply Ursa Major going around the North Star in 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.09 seconds, that calculates to 364 days in a solar year. And they knew the 354 lunar count and why the first six months equated to 177 days. That's what they monitored outside in creation. And they made charts of it by hand. So again, this is something so easy to do and why so many are now doing it. So yes, there is only one name for the Father, Yahuwah. There's only one name for the Son, Yahushua. And Bereans will call upon that. That's the purpose and intent of these scriptural study videos. Just like there's only one new moon day and one preparation day on the 14th day of the first month of Abib. Not two. This is why we work out our own deliverance with fear and trembling with that mindset scripturally. And why we say all praise and esteem to the sovereign of the ages. Before the foundation of the world, after the foundation of the world in the age that we're in right now, this small little time period called the age of man, getting ready for the millennium, for the Messiah Yahushua to rule with his 144, and then the age of the Yahuwah when he rules and comes with, down with his people. Once the Messiah Yahushua puts all enemies under his feet, which the last enemy is death, hands over the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, to his father, and the father comes for future eternity. All praise and esteem to the sovereign of the ages, to the almighty Yahuwah who sits on the throne. Remember, Messiah Yahushua sits at the right hand. To the almighty Yahuwah, our father lights, who alone is wise to respect and esteem forever and ever. 1 Timothy 1.17 May the peace of the Almighty Yahuwah, which surpasses all understanding, guard your heart and mind through Messiah Yahushua. Again, Yahuwah is the greater light. The lesser light is the word, Messiah Yahushua, the anointed one of Yahuwah. And as the psalmist had read in chapter 47, verse 2, For Yahuwah Most High is awesome, a great sovereign over all of the earth. This is why we say, have a awesome day. So in closing, may the Father of Lights, the only self-existent one, Yahuwah himself, continue to keep and guard us, even during this upcoming amazing Passover eclipse of 2022. And may the Messiah Yahushua be in everything we say and do. Have a awesome Passover, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you on the other side after First Fruits.